So, Gumba Malgan, Gumba Nani Gyaninju, Yurigiri State Library of Queensland Goo, which is good evening. It's good to see you here and welcome, friends, to the State Library of Queensland. My name is Vicky McDonald and it's my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland. And on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you to our first Game Changers event for the year with Juliet Wright OAM. But I'd like to begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. At State Library of Queensland, we are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to tonight's special guest, Juliet Wright, OAM, our facilitator, lecturer and researcher at the Australian Centre of Philanthropy and Non-Profit Studies at QT, Dr Ruth Knight. I also welcome our new uh, chair of the Library Board of Queensland, Debbie Best, uh, Professor Amanda Goodmanson, Executive Dean of Faculty of Business and Law at QUT, members of the Library Board of Queensland, the Queensland Library Foundation Council, and the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Management Committee and Induction Committee. I'd also very much like to welcome our colleagues from our founding partner, QUT, and also generous sponsors, Picture Partners, Channel 7, Morgans, Ray White, and Springfield Group and also friends of State Library and QUT. It's fantastic to see you here tonight, both in the auditorium and also online. So Game Changers is a Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame initiative, a partnership between QUT and State Library and initially with the Queensland Library Foundation as well. The Queensland Library Foundation supports many innovative and important projects that benefit all Queenslanders. And this can only be done with the help of our valued donors, big and small. Tonight's guest is well known in the world of philanthropy. Juliet Wright founded the Australian donations platform, Give It, in 2009, making donating in the digital age personal and targeted. It is particularly fitting to welcome Juliet to State Library on International Women's Day. And the theme this year is Cracking the Code, Innovation for a Gender Equal Future. Cracking the Code highlights the role that bold, transformative ideas, inclusive technologies and accessible education can play in combating discrimination and marginalisation. Juliet's story, which you'll hear tonight, highlights the power of technology to connect communities and directly help people in need. Through Give It, Juliet's idea, Juliet's idea to address humanitarian challenges from the global pandemic to local fires and floods was truly transformative. During the 2011 Queensland floods, Give It took the lead as the state government's official website for managing donations. It now partners with other state governments across the country through its disaster recovery and emergency service. Joining Juliet tonight is Dr Ruth Knight, who will facilitate this evening's conversation. Ruth is a lecturer and researcher with an impressive 20-year career in health and community services. Her passion for finding innovative ways to achieve social change is driven by her experience working with homelessness, suicide prevention, community development, culture and leadership. Tonight's conversation is broadcast on Facebook Live and on State Library's live stream page. We'll also be using Slido to collect questions from both online and auditorium audiences. So if you go to slido.com and enter the code QBLHOF, or simply scan the QR code that appears on the screen. It's quite big on the screen, so it makes it easier. And the, the QR code will come up during the, um, the evening as well. And Ruth will do her best to get to as many questions as possible. And one thing that I like about Slido is you can choose the questions that you like that other people have written, and they go to the top. So do vote for the questions as we go. If you do experience connection issues on our website, head over to our Facebook page and you can view the talk there as well. And if you are sharing your thoughts about tonight's conversation on social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag QBLHoff as well. So I do hope that you enjoy the conversation and uh, I'll hand it over to Ruth now. So thank you, Ruth. Hello. Hi, everybody. Happy International Women's Day. Yes. Yes. 
Um, my name is Ruth Knight, and it is an absolute pleasure to be with you all tonight and to be talking with Juliet. I've got some very exciting questions to ask you, Juliet. Quite personal, but first actually. of all, um, <laughs> I'd like to just begin also by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands that we're meeting on tonight and to pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to thank Candice and Kelly over here who are helping us. They are Auslan interpreters and I think it's wonderful that they've joined us today. So thank you so much, Candice and Kelly. Um, just want to make a very quick uh, housekeeping uh, announcement is that if you do need to leave for any reason during the next hour, please just go up the stairs there into the exit at the back. That's probably the most uh, best exit to go to. So if you need to leave at all. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping. I think we should start to get to know you, Juliet. And as I said, I have got some questions ready to fire at you. Um, but this is a conversation with everybody here tonight, both in the room and online. So is everybody ready to use Slido? Everybody got <laughs> the... Got, you're allowed to bring your phones out and use that. Um, yes, normally in class I say put your phones away, but no, it's okay. Tonight you can get your phones out. And of course, everybody online as well, you can participate using Slido. And I've got the questions coming up here uh, so I can see what your questions are. And so I'm going to try and have a look at that while I'm talking to Juliet. And uh, we'll either get to those questions as we're chatting or we will definitely make time for questions at the end. So I say get your questions in, start voting so that you can get your question asked. Okay? Yes. Are we ready? Are you ready? <laughs> Well, <laughs> Juliet, um, first of all, we want to get to know you and who you are as a person. And so I think what would be a really good thing to know is who were you before Give It? You know, where, what's your background? What were you doing? Tell us a little bit about what was going on before 2009. I have always been passionate about helping people. And I think that's because of my parents. My dad was a complimentary doctor. My mum was a nurse, a dietitian, and then I became a nutritionist and naturopath. <laughs> you can see the household theme here. And, um, but I didn't have what they had, which was this unlimited tap for giving. When I, was, um, when I was a naturopath and a nutritionist, and I was dealing with people one-on-one, -on -one, I found that I had deep empathy. Like I would go into their feelings. It wasn't, it was, and I burnt out all the time. So when I'd had the kids in 2007 and 2008, and I was looking after, you know, two kids 20 months apart, I pretty quickly realised that I could not go back into being a clinician like that because I would just get burnt out all the time. And then I'd have to come home and be a carer. So I knew that, I, that part of my world was wrapping up. I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought maybe I should go into teaching and training because I was a pure extrovert back then too. And I was thinking, oh, maybe I should do that. But um, lo and behold, I had a big big overweight baby and that changed everything. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. <laughs> um, so you didn't think of yourself as a philanthropist at that time. No, it sounds not at all. like you were just starting to just realise that there was an opportunity to perhaps change the way that people gave. So what were you thinking around giving and philanthropy at the time? Did you even realise where this was all leading? I found giving really hard. I had two bags of baby clothes that Hudson completely outgrew or I wouldn't let him wear because he'd, he really just completely bypassed double zero and triple zero clothes. He just went straight from triple zero, sorry, to, to zero and one. And um, I couldn't find a charity all the way from Burpengary all the way down into Brisbane City to Quarry Street, I could not find one charity that would take these clothes. And I was, uh, it was hard. And I mean, we had the Yellow Pages back then and I don't think anonymous women's shelters advertised themselves in the yeah. Yellow Pages. Yeah. And we didn't have the internet up and going yeah. as well. And they weren't registered on Facebook or anything, nothing like that was existing. But when I rang these, when I did find some charities and they said, oh, we don't want the baby clothes. I was like, what do you need? And oh boy, my curiosity was completely, I was, I was so curious. I was in wonder. I went to 
bed thinking about it. Like I was, I, the first thing I said, well, what do you need? And they said they need a closed toe work boots and sanitary items. And just yeah. by donating those two items, I realised that charities had no way of requesting the daily needs of their clients. There was no platform, there was no way for them to promote the daily needs of their clients. I thought that they had a warehouse out the back like the Salvos. No, no, 99.99% of charities do not have a warehouse. Yep. And they don't have enough room for a bike or a microwave. They have little offices just like us. And the third thing is, is that we're really, particularly me, I was really bad at guessing what people actually really needed. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll, you know, how can we actually promote the daily needs of the clients and make sure that the privacy of the recipient is sacrosanct? And I suppose that's when I started thinking about the Give It model and developing a, developing a platform in my mind where charities, they get authenticated and then they can request the items that they need. And then I'm just going to go and shake a tail feather <laughs> and then I'm going to find people to fulfil that need. And that's really where Give It wow. was born. Yeah, wow. just through that concept of... But that the charity had to pass it on to the recipient because I don't want you meeting them because they're vulnerable and they're important, but they're vulnerable. Yeah. So I was really... Really, I know it's funny, it's only in hindsight that I realised I was building a model that was actually protecting me because I can't help these people because I'm too... Yeah, I'd cry all the time, I'd be hopeless. But I was supporting the charities who I ca can work with and I was supporting donors who I can work with, but the real goal was to yeah. help the people in yeah. need. So it sounds like you were identifying a problem around giving and how can more people become philanthropists mm. in sometimes very small ways. Yeah. Um, it, they don't have to give large amounts of money, large amounts of things, but you were able to then partner with these organisations. And in fact, I was working at one and remember when Give It started and thought, wow, this is cool. Um, so it was your ability to partner with these communities community organisations and for them to realise how how great it was to be able to say, guess what, we need this, and then mm. a, a, and somebody out in the community could say, I can help. Mm. Well, I mean, I didn't know that it was going to work. In fact, um, I failed building the website twice dismally. I was... Um, <laughs> so I built the website and it wasn't automatic. I, if you donated a microwave, I wanted it to automatically fall off the list. Anyway, you know, burnt, got burnt. I just went, okay, I'm going to get a contract and it'll be automatic and, you know, raised money, put, you know, saved up money. And I remember I had two kids, really young kids, so I wasn't working, so I was kind of getting scrapes together <laughs> and uh, got the second website up and it wasn't automatic. And I realised when I was bathing the kids one day that he said, oh, it is automatic. You just need to log in, press the button that says microwave, and it will automatically pull off the list. And I'm like, no, I'm literally bathing the kids. I don't want two people donating a microwave. Like, I thought I had yeah. this sorted, and I felt total failure. I also knew that no one in my world thought it was going to work. Not one person wow. in my whole universe thought that this was going to work. And I remember actually bending over, and I thought... I think it was anger, but I think I was literally wrenching in the gut and going, I, I, I am totally alone in this idea. No one thinks it's going to work. and The universe is even against me. And I remember um, the kids were safe in the bath, by the way, everybody else. <laughs> Don't ask. Um, and I, I, I realised that I actually have to ignore the universe and everyone in it because I actually think that someone out there might want to fulfil an actual need. I, I believe that someone would go and deliver a fridge to the charity that if they if they need if that, that if the charity need. I do believe that the charity could possibly hire a truck and go and pick up that donation. I do believe that they can connect. We don't have to bring it straight to the recipient's house. And because I was really dogged that this was their their privacy was sacrosanct. It was not the donor and them must, must not meet. And um, and everybody said, oh, it's so much easier, just, you know, and I said, no. Uh, a counsellor told me a story where this beautiful donors actually helped, uh, they got a fridge and they hired a, tra a trailer and they were putting it into this man's house. And when they got up, and it was Red Hill, can you imagine how many stairs, you know, climbing up, 
and they, they climb up and they put the fridge in there and the man is sitting in front of a huge big plasma and he uh, grunts at them and he says, take the old fridge. And like these people are offended and um, what they don't realise is that he has severe schizophrenia. His mother has literally given him the plasma and walked away and said, that's it, I can't deal with you anymore. So he's by himself in the plasma. We can't, we can only have social workers dealing with people who are in need. So people didn't think the model was going to work, but I can tell you in that one moment, kids were still safe in the bath, and I went, no, fuck you, universe, and everyone in it, I'm actually going to do it anyway, because there's going to be someone out there, and even if I just do one donation, it'll be worth it. Just one donation through the system, be worth it. That's it, just one. Well, you're already actually showing us that one of the best attributes of social entrepreneurs is persistence. <laughs> so <laughs> you're yeah. actually demonstrating it really well now. But we know, and you've already just shared, that there were challenges right from the beginning. So I suppose maybe you could think back and tell us, you know, what would you do differently hmm. if you did it again, because you've been through some highs and lows and this, mm -hmm. you've been very persistent, but would you do anything differently now? This is, of all the questions I think if I've ever been asked in my career, I have spent pondering, I've pondered this one. Firstly, I wish that I could have done it a lot easier, like relaxed and easy. I saw the boys from Orange Sky Laundry and they're always so relaxed and having <laughs> yeah. fun. They even talked to, they told me, oh, we got a contract with Adelaide, you know, with South Australia. And I was like, that's it. I have not been able to get a contract with South Australia still. And, I, and they said, oh, we, did, we even insisted that we weren't going to do any reporting. I'm like, oh, God. These boys, they were, they, they were like my mentors of relaxed. I wish that I could have done give it that relaxed. And, um, but it was online giving, even cash, you know, even credit card giving yeah. in, back in 2010 particularly, it was, it was, it was not a big thing. There, I think there was a text message way, there, was, there were innovations around capturing people when they were watching television, but it hadn't been done. So I, I quite um, honestly feel like I was shoving an idea, or it was more like I've always felt like I've got a big boulder and I'm just pushing it up a hill, and if I relax a bit, I'm going to go two step backwards. So the giver journey was the hardest thing that I have ever done and I lost a lot of sleep. So I really truly wish that I could have done it easier. But the second thing um, is, uh, I'm not going to cry. Um, I am not exactly the bottle that people want to hear the message from. Is that did that come out right? I am not, people don't expect the message to come out of this bottle. So I, um, I like to do my hair. I like to, uh, I like to wear nice clothes and have pretty shoes. I like to hang out with fashion designers. <laughs> I like, um, I like, I like, I like Paris. You know, I like, I love Give It and I love, and I am overly enthusiastic and I am passionate and I do not fit the mould as an anti-poverty advocate. I know that. And I do not fit the mould as a CEO. And I've had a lot of people, and I'm bringing this up because it's International Women's Day today, and I have thought about in my career, how can I tone myself down to make other people comfortable? and what do I need to wear to this to make other people more comfortable? And what do I need to say? And do I need to talk more seriously? And, and I just thought, you know, all of that is just messages from everyone just telling me to stop being happy. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's like I, was, I would even be in an auditorium and a woman stood up and said, you just shouldn't do this because you're an antipot. Wow. You don't look the part. And I was like, what is not looking the part? So I feel like I had a very privileged uh, space where my husband could afford to basically fund me and the family while I actually set up Give It for 10 years. And, um, and it's because of him and his incredible generosity and support. I don't, you know, I'm really lucky that I'm prosperous and fun and happy, but you know, it's been, um, it's been a point of contention. 
Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Mm. Um, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's obviously... Hard question out of the way. You're going to have fun now. <laughs> yeah, look, just listening to you talking about, you know, what is this ideal person then who is a, an advocate or is someone who champions innovation to uh, help people in need or the community? Um, so I'm just wondering now, um, you know, if you met young people or people in the audience today who were thinking, I would love to be an innovator, I would love to do something like this, what would your, you know, what was one piece of advice then, given what you just said, hmm. what is the one thing that you could look at people and say, you know what, hmm. you know? Um, I, I, I know this is probably, I just never, ever, 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 ever give up. Like, yeah. maybe edit, maybe edit a bit, test, constrict, test, constrict, edit, maybe. But if you actually think you can do it, really, honestly, you're going to get a lot of obstruction. Actually, I think sometimes when you're doing something different, powerful and good, that's when you're going to get the most heat. So actually go, oh, hello, here's the haters. Okay, here's the... And, oh God, I absolutely love my parents. You know, here's the no votes, <laughs> you know? Like, oh, thank you. So one of my things is that, for innovators, is write down all the people that told you that you couldn't do it. Get them to a, a hall, very long table with some fluoros and some highlighters and get them to hallucinate all the ways in which you will fail. Maybe get some champagne in there as well. I don't know, whatever gets, you know, you're all laughing and hallucinate all the ways in which you'll fail and there's your risk register and say, thank you so much, I really appreciate you. <laughs> bye bye now. <laughs> so 2009, we're talking about these early years and you know, we're 14 years later, but you're hmm. really talking about the, your, your, obviously your attributes as an innovator, as a, a person who is courageous and persistent on something that you want to achieve. But tell us a little bit about maybe how your leadership has changed because you've scaled, give it, in those yeah. years um, in amazing ways. Um, and I want to hear a little bit about that. So some of the ways that you've been able to scale. But I'm really interested in hearing about your perception of leadership or your perspective on leadership as you've grown and learned through all these lessons. You know, what, what's happened to you in terms of your leadership style or how you work with people? Um, I've always prized myself on being inclusive, I hope, I hope. I, I'm, and I'm free for anybody up there to say, I remember you not being inclusive. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I remember always having, a, I just thought that the Give It volunteers knew as much about the business sometimes as the, you know, but from a different perspective as the board members, so just include everybody in decisions. I also realised that um, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm always thinking up really big ideas and, and thinking big, and I know that when I'm dreaming it's actually planning. But I also realised that now, my leadership has changed because I realise that I'm more defined by what I say no to than actually what I say yes to. I had a board member who's actually retiring this year from the Give It board, his name is Jonathan, and I'd come up with this big, great idea, and he'd, he'd, he'd reach over and he goes, Juliet, is this in the strategic plan? And I'd be like, mm -hmm. and he goes, is it in line with the vision and mission? And I'd be like, mm. and then he goes, Juliet, do you have time? And I suppose that his continuous gentle water, you know, has changed me in a way because I actually now think really big ideas, particularly when I'm in a leadership role and I think about really big ideas, and then I actually do an ecology check and just make sure all parts of the business and all parts of my world are actually in ecology with that idea mm -hmm. as well. And some of them don't go ahead mm -hmm. because it's, sometimes it's a little bit taking you off the mission, isn't it? Sometimes it's a bit distracting because business as usual can be a bit boring for an entrepreneur. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Anybody here know about that? So, so, <laughs> so how did you grow your team? I mean, I'm just interested then, who was attracted to come and work with Give It? And oh, as you amazing. were, you know, developing this organisation and as it was growing, mm. who was coming and working with you and how did you find those people who were aligned with what you were trying to achieve? My luck in Growing Give It is completely because I have had really intelligent women, like I'm talking super smart, genius women, 
attracted to the idea of working with me to grow Give It. So they've loved the idea of the platform. So I've stepped down as CEO and we have a full female executive team at Give It and they are taking their, and they're making their mark and they are incredible. And I feel like as a leader, one of the things that was my role is to, for them to bring their genius to the table, thank you, but for me to actually make sure that they had a very flexible workplace so that they could lean into mm. their family, but also providing them that was lean, them leaning into their career and their profession while they were at Give It. So all I had to do, while they just beamed their sunshine onto Give It to help it grow, all I needed to do was just give them that workplace flexibility so that it could still be a yummy mummy. And um, yeah, mm. I think that really, that's, that, that's the winning team, that's the winning recipe for me. And have you got some thoughts on maybe the future of leadership? I mean, as your leadership has evolved mm. and grown, um, do you see yourself becoming a different leader then, or you've you've moved out of that CEO role? Like, what what does the future look for look like for you? Well, I am a CEO again, by the way, so I just have to put a caveat there. But I I was looking um, through and I'm obsessed with foreign politics. I just, it's like days of our lives reading what's, you know, it's really interesting and ever changing and it's fascinating to me and I'm, I'm, I'm quite addicted to it. But I've actually been watching leadership in corporations, in countries, and I think it's really collaborative versus, um, oh my God, I've forgotten the word, Dem autocratic. Autocratic, and um, you can see this in, you know, sorry, sound guys. Um, you can see this, like, for example, you have the Steve Jobs, you know, went before, he got a bit flexible in the end, but you got the Steve Jobs and the Elon Musks, and then you've got really collaborative leaders. My children are 14 and 16 next week, and I'm noticing that they're really struggling with the group activities. And I thought, oh, this is great. I, like, trouble away, because this is where they learn leadership, but this is where collaborativeness, their, their collaborative abilities actually start to form, and I think that that needs, you have to have both to have a good leader. So I feel a, co a collaborative leadership, and um, if we're ever gonna help our kids make it as executives or even just great teammates, I think that that, that group work is really important. I'm really leaning in and making sure that I support them 100% in that. Yeah. Um, I want to pick up on something you said earlier, actually, about, you know, when you were first thinking about this and your level of empathy for people. Um, how, how, yeah. How, how is the, the, the concept of empathy as you've been working with people? Because I'd love to hear a story of how you've used empathy to grow Give It. Because these people who you know need things, mm -hmm. um, you, you, don't, you don't know them personally, but you get to know their stories. And of course, if you look at Give It, you'll see their stories. Not everything, obviously. Yeah. Um, but you see a, a little keyhole into why they need something. Hmm. How has empathy been part of, um, yeah, how you've grown Give It and, and what... Story. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, tell yeah, me about the, that. Yeah, it's the story. Um, I, I think for the first eight years, I didn't capture the stories well enough on Give It. And I think that the moment we started capturing, and like had a team member who could capture the stories, I think that's when um, we started, you know, having great presence on social media and things like that, and people would talk about us. But I realised the power of story. Um, there was a boy who had come out from Eritrea with his brother and his mother and they had no language whatsoever. And the charity requested a pair of soccer boots for the older brother, and it got quickly donated, which was great. And um, anyway, apparently he was an absolute football star. He arrived in the country, he had absolutely no community, no friends, no language. Anyway, after these football boots were on his foot, just for about four seconds, he then had a team, he had a coach, and uh, he had a community, his mother had, you know, a breakfast group, a team, you know, and uh, I was saying about two weeks later, he would have had a girlfriend, you know, it would have <laughs> been an absolute game. And he was a game changer. And so I wanted to start capturing stories like that, like that boy who donated those football boots, seriously, had a massive impact in a community, yeah. in yeah. a community. So, so trying to track that, you know, and, and, and build the story upon story and let people know that um, 
their seriously small item can make a massive difference to people's lives. Yeah. Tapping I, into that. That ripple effect of giving, because it not only does make the, the giver feel good, mm. but obviously just something small. You never know when it's actually going to have a massive impact on someone's life. Well, you do, because every single item at Give It is an authentic need registered by a charity that's taken a fair amount of time to put that request up there, yeah. and it's authentic. They can't afford to get a no-interest loan on it. They won't have it unless they receive it from someone who's good, who could either... You can buy it through the website now, or you can give the item. So, honestly, these people are our most impoverished and vulnerable. So every single item, I think... Oh, I think there's like over 50,000 items on the website at yes, the moment. Yes, there's a lot on there. I, I get very that. overwhelmed when I think about that. So I, yes. And two thirds of them are for domestic violence. So that's just, there's just a plague. When you realise that all, you know, two thirds of the needs, there's every, you know, pretty much every toy on there. And it's pretty devastating. So as a giver, I can look through your list of Lots of items, we won't mention how many, because there's a lot. Yeah. Um, but I can look through and I can see, well, do I have that particular thing to give? Mm. So do I have a laptop or a toothbrush or whatever it is that's, that's there? You can filter it down, you can say white goods, helping someone with domestic yeah. violence or any, any type of category. So I can either then uh, say I have something to give away. You can pledge it in the online I can't warehouse. I pledge it. Okay, well, so that's tell a me, funny... So tell me that's how... A, okay, that's a funny story. There's lots of bits to this website. This, this is a funny story, actually. So Give It was about two weeks old. Started off with about eight charities and then, you know, went to 16 and uh, my husband uh, was leaving for work. And by the way, I'm about to talk about a virtual warehouse, but this has won numerous innovation awards, <laughs> like loads. <laughs> but anyway, I'll just put a caveat there. And um, my husband was at the door going, are you going to the shops today? And I said, no, I am working. I've doing give it and uh, he said well yeah I uh, really need some undies and I was like yeah no I've got you got heaps and he goes no you've done all the washing for the kids but you haven't done any of mine <laughs> and I went downstairs and it's true all the non-priority stuff had been <laughs> and um, so I'm not wasn't a great stay at home mum really was I and um, I was working full time from home oh, yeah. and um, anyway he said what's the problem and I said well all the charities have got the list of needs on the website and there's, you know, microwave, bike, all of this stuff. But people want to give stuff that's not on the list. And so what I'm doing is I'm collating all of the emails and then I'm asking who wants to be on the daily or the bi-weekly kind of list. Anyway, so I collate all the other offers and then I email them to the charity. And <laughs> anyway, best in first dress, the charity will say, I'll take that household of items, but I don't want the toys. And then they're splitting up, oh. and it was just getting a bit manual. And he goes, isn't the website supposed to be automatic? It's about being automatic, right? And I'm like, it's supposed to be automatic, but this part's not. And he sells sheds. So he said, well, why don't you have a virtual shed? And we kind of brainstormed it together. But just for this, can we just give Glenn total credit for the virtual <laughs> warehouse? <laughs> And so what happens is that you can take a photograph of anything that you own. You go and put it, just put it on your phone and then go on to give it and you can pledge the items that you have around the house to give and they go into the online warehouse where charities log in, put in their password and how far they're willing to travel and put in the word bed and they see all the beds that wow. are on offer. And they'll see that you've said pick up or you could drop off or post if it's small. And so... Um, yeah, it, it, and actually, it worked really, really well. In the first year, 3,000 items were donated, and half of the time, the charity logged in, found what they needed, and half the time, they couldn't find what they needed, so then they made a request, and the re request went onto the front page of the website. Sounds like it uh, freed up your time to do that laundry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, now so you've this, got it all happening. So we're talking about innovation, and really, what did that innovation come from? Dirty undies, yes, but it came from <laughs> my reluctance to do the laundry. Yes, it did, but it um, it also came from a place of like this isn't working. So let's tweak it. Like yeah. this 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 idea yeah. is not fully formed yet. But when the 2011 floods happened. Uh, the website got 1.8 million hits in 10 days and all of those wow. offers were captured in the virtual warehouse and weren't inundating poor, 
yes. communities that were also dealing with the floods, but they also weren't inundated with poor quality donations. But obviously you saw that that actually also happened. Yeah. So that, that disaster was a real learning curve for me. And was that flood, that disaster, was that the time that really everybody started to go, wow, we need Give It. Like, this yeah. was now not something Well, we that... need Give It to be bigger. <laughs> yes. We, More we staff. Actually, so, us staff member. Yeah. So, so how did people start using it around the, the flood time? We were 100% volunteers at that point, by the way. And um, and one was in Byron Bay and one was in Japan, and it was pretty, it was pretty heavy going. But what I realised what was really devastating about that is that when people give through Give It, they're really beautiful givers and they give quality items and maybe there's 5% of the items aren't great quality. And I call it like the grandmother's perspective, like um, the Nana perspective is that I've been sleeping on that bed for 20 years, love. It's perfectly <laughs> fine. And so no, Nana, it's not. Yeah. Um, I won't, I don't want to sleep on that bed. So I don't think, it's not good enough to give to me. So I think it's not good enough to give to someone else. And so now, um, but in a disaster, so I think 5%, so everything that was going through Give It was 95% excellent. But when the disaster hit, everything went to poop. It was the most wow. outpouring of the most disgusting, broken, poor quality, mouse-covered, snake-infested. Wow. Um, well, they just thought that people lost everything and therefore people would take anything, which is actually the opposite. So if you just imagine losing absolutely everything right now, do you actually want my pillow? No, you really don't want my pillow. Do you want my old sand shoes or my concaved husband's leather shoes? No, you don't. People get quite fussy when they have nothing, yeah. as they should be. And what happens is, is when they receive poor quality, their dignity goes yeah. right down yeah. and they and it, it really affects their mental health. Yeah. So the quality issue is now why on Give It 100% of the items that go through, we need a photograph. Yeah. It's just because the charities can see the stains and they can see the mould and for work health and safety reasons, they can't touch that stuff either. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm just processing all of this and thinking about all the logistics involved um, because this The does first website's a little bit different than the current <laughs> website, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit better. Um, but word got out, didn't it? I mean, yeah. word got out. And tell me then what happened, how you, you were just Queensland-based or even Brisbane-based originally. Tell me then what happened, how it scaled, because this is an innovation that, you know, people started to realise we need give it. How did it grow and, and where is it now? Like, mm. what's going on right now? Well, I think a few milestones that were really important was that I brought on a good board, like the, a board to be proud of. And I brought in people that, um, that gave, because I am who I am, and they gave the organisation kind of like, not a heaviness, but like that governance groundedness that... I was, you know, I was doing all these other roles. I was a fundraiser, I was this, I was that. But, you know, they would focus on governance and policy. And so I had, you know, so it's kind of the organisation got grounded. And um, I give them total credit for that because don't talk to me about governance. And <laughs> so I, I know all about it, but it really makes me want to go to bed. And so like, do oh, get it, get it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I felt a really powerful board. I also felt that the Queensland government came on board and gave, give it its first funding ever to manage offers of goods and services in times of disasters. So, you know, that was a game changer. And then I realised that other cities and other towns and other communities were inundated with poor quality donations post-disaster. So we created the um, a disaster recovery service for state governments. And that's given us that national presence. But, you know, then suddenly I am a government liaison and government stakeholder and then I'm a government reporter. And so I've had a massive learning journey across all of that. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so sustainability is hard in the not-for-profit sector, as you all know. It's a really competitive space. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your typical day look like? Like, what are you, who are you? Well, I've stepped, down as, I, 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 well I'm step, I've stepped down as CEO of Give It Now, so I'm ambassador and a director. Um, but at the time, uh, my average day was I didn't have enough time to buy bread. Yeah. Yeah, and I was busy. It was, it was so busy. Um, I had to, I, I've, I'm stepping into a new um, business. I'm creating a new business. And I had to ask the kids' permission to start a new business. And 
they were a little bit still traumatised by how busy I was back then. And that was, you know, two or three years ago now. So they, it was a family negotiation um, to, for me not to be as present. But again. it sounds like you're an innovator at heart. Um, if you're looking to do more things now, um, which I'll get to maybe mm. in a moment about, you know, what's the future look like. But I really want to pick up on something that I'm noting um, is that you're not only enabling philanthropy to change, like the way that we give and you're changing, you're encouraging the person on the street who would never think of themselves as a philanthropist. Mm. Now they can, now they can give. Um, but you're also actually thinking about waste Mm. And the circular economy, which is what we're talking a lot about in the social enterprise sector, yeah. um, it sounds like you're really reducing waste and really reusing, which other people would typically take to the tip. Yeah, we measure how much um, we prevent from going to landfill now in tonnes. Yeah, right. Yeah. So is that a like an unexpected outcome of what you've been doing? No, was I always knew that we were preventing landfill because we're making sure that people actually only give communities exactly what they request. Yeah. I feel like I'm flipping the model where instead of donors wanting to give what they've got, now let's flip it and actually find out what communities actually need yeah. and actually only fulfil that need. Because when they get what they need, when they request it, then they move on to the next phase of recovery. So, and I also feel like because we've got that buy local theme, which I'll explain in a minute, but we, it's all about making strengthening communities. So give it's about strengthening communities and making sure that they're not inundated mm. with waste, that they all yeah. go, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure most of them are retired now, but about six or seven years ago, I spoke to a lot of mayors and most of them confessed to midnight dumping, which means that the donations would come in, in an event, so very big cyclone in the area, stuff would come in to a warehouse, then a scooper would come and then take it to the tip and then be fresh, open new shed in the morning because there was just that much stuff yeah. coming in. It, yeah. There was trucks coming in yeah. from out of town, South Australia, with no, no address, just go to Bundy. Go to Bundaberg, and Bundaberg are like, "Yeah, well, we actually have clothes. Like, there's a Kmart just there." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I really just want to know what it, what are some of your highlights over these 14 years that you've been doing this now? Mm. It, you know, you've been making a lot of impact in many ways. You've been making a difference to people's lives all over Australia now. Um, what are, what do you think are your big moments, your big highlights that you look back and you go, "Yes." You know, well, I think that it, was worth it. I, I was... think it's now because uh, Give It's doing 200,000 donations a month. And it's just about to hit 7.5 yeah. million donations. <laughs> and I, I love that because I just want to go back to the bathtub scene and I just want to say, you go, girl. Like, you've yeah. got, you know, just go. Yeah. And I, I think I was there anyway in that. But it feels very... Um, it's, I, it's, can I say it's healing? Like, it's just, it's nice to uh, say, no, the universe wasn't against you. <laughs> no, yeah. you're okay. It was a good idea. You just made a few mistakes. It's okay. Yeah, so um, I think now I'm, I'm so chuffed and I'm so proud of the Give It team and I'm so proud to be a part of its story. Like, I mean, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow beyond me. You know, it's, it's, it's a model that anyway, and this is where we're heading, I suppose, is the fact is that I've been waiting and waiting for someone to do this overseas, and they haven't yet. Oh. Hmm. Could it be the UK? Because I hear that you've got a very famous patron. Yes, I do. Tell, tell us about your patron <laughs> and how that happened. So um, the uh, 2020 fires hit, and you knew how you know how catastrophic they were for communities all down the eastern seaboard, and um, it was catastrophic disaster. And the Clarence House at the time, her then Her Royal Highness Duchess Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, reached out and said, I would like to give a modest donation to give it. And I took the call and from her from her team and I said, Thank you, that would be incredible. And we spread and we made that donation go far. So in about 2014, I actually realised donations can do great harm. There was an incident in Long... Uh, no, sorry. There was an incident in a drought-affected area. And um, 
the donations of stationary supplies was brought into the town. And it had a deep negative impact on a, uh, on a business community there. And it was not a good impact. And I realised that in disasters, that the number of donations that are going through give it into the communities that are secondhand or coming from out of town is having a negative impact. So in 2014, we made a decision. I wrote a memo, very Jerry, Jerry Maguire. I wrote a memo to the board and even all the Give It team saying, I think that we should ask people to buy items locally and we should stimulate the local economy. And therefore, really competing with the Fab Five, you know, Red Cross, and I was like, ah. Oh. I'm going to be a little fish with the sharks. There's no way, give it's going to fail. Anyway, we all decided that we were going to make the change. But lo and behold, everybody loved it. Every local business, every cafe, every, every local councillor, every regional mayor just went, oh, thank you so much. So if you give to give it, 100% of the funds will be spent locally, helping the people that we, that we need to support, but helping them through a local business. Anyway, so Camilla really, sorry, Her Royal Highness really liked that idea. And um, she did, she really liked that idea. And when we gave her the acquittal with, you know, beautiful pictures of where her, her you know, donation had gone, she was so impressed that such a modest amount of money had just been spread so far. She bought 40 back to school packs for kids from Ebor. She bought a farmer, a water tank, an irrigation to to water for the, for the animals and for his family, and it went on and on. We, we did good. We made that coin stretch. Anyway, and then they said, look, we're just so impressed if there's anything else we can do. And I said, well, um, <laughs> I'm sure I can think of something. Um, how would uh, Her Royal Highness be interested in being our patron? And, um, and she said, oh, well, uh, she's, Her Royal Highness is not a patron of anyone outside of the UK. And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking, she's going to be queen. You know, she's going to have to have a Commonwealth spread. <laughs> and, um, and I said, would she be OK about being our patron uh, in Australia? And we're a charity. We support 4,500 charities across Australia. Like, we, we call ourselves the Charities for Charity, the Charity for Charities. And uh, she said yes. Wow. I think the coolest part is, though, is the kids will sometimes ask me, what did you do today? And I said, oh, I was talking to Buckingham Palace. And they go... <laughs> and I go, yeah. <laughs> so we're all next time they're out on a visit, on the royal visit, we're yeah. all coming round to have tea round your well, house. Yeah, it's funny. I was taking Hudson to soccer, and um, oh, we had a nice big show and share with um, Her Royal Highness. I had a one-on-one, -on -one and then the whole team came on, and we had this because it was uh, COVID. And I said, she said, oh, I love Australia, and I said, yeah, I'd love to meet you. And it would just be, I'll fly to wherever you land. Like, I'll come and meet you. And she said, that would be really wonderful. But she goes, I love Australians and I love their sense of humour. Anyway, the next day I got a call from the Department of Communities going, did you invite the royals to Brisbane <laughs> yesterday? <laughs> and I'm like, OK, hang on. Hudson's like, where's my shin pads? And I'm like, OK, oh, honey, I've really got to take this call. <laughs> they wanted a script of what I had said. I was like, no, I am not, I, I know I did not invite the royals. I just did not invite the royals. <laughs> <laughs> At all, I said that she'd be very welcome. And then, yeah. by the way, in the conversation, I said you'd have to quarantine. If you did come out these, in the next few weeks, you'd have to... Maybe I didn't invite her. Uh, if, you did, <laughs> if you came out, you'd have to quarantine for two weeks. She goes, oh, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> So I don't have that time. Okay. Well, cross yeah. fingers soon, she'll come yeah, out and, yeah. and come and see you and, and the family. I think that she'll come out. Well, she's going to do it. I would say they'll do a Commonwealth tour. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the yeah, next few years. After the coronation. Yeah. All right, well... Let's get back to you, because you're the more important person, of course. Um, look, uh, I, I think we're going to have to look yeah, we're at gonna, some questions are going soon. Off. Okay, okay, number six. But I, before, we, before we have a look at the questions, and I, and I hope you're all going into Slido and putting some questions in there. Um, first of all, I've got two really important questions. In fact, I've got more than two, but I, I'm running out of time. Yeah. So I think um, the first thing that I really want to ask you, because I'm really into philanthropy and non-profit studies, that's um, what I, I, I love thinking about a lot. Um, what's your take right now on what we have to do further about improving people's uh, understanding of philanthropy and giving because we know that in actual fact less people are giving mm. um, and it, they, we've had the pandemic we've got a lot of people in financial stress we understand that so no, nobody should made to f 
feel that they have to give. But is there more that we can do? Now we're coming out the other side of the pandemic and there's so many people in need. Yeah. You know that there's so many people in need. How can we continue to innovate, I suppose, the world of philanthropy and how people give and encouraging mm. people to understand the power of giving? Is there anything that you're thinking about right now? So that's, again, donor-driven. So um, I think that it is, you know, obviously about making sure that, you know, people spend their money wisely, but I'm really recipient driven. So I want to make sure that the ideas that make sure the right people get the right things in the right way, yeah. those ideas are fed. Those ideas of let's make sure it comes from the problem this way and then let's meet the problem. We're all clever. We can do that. Rather than how are we going to spend the money wisely to do it? Like, that's just too hard a problem. I'm not smart enough for that. But I am helpful when it comes to people are impoverished. They need to get the right things in the right way. And so why don't we fund ideas that help that grassroots help, that community information, charities have it, and help all of that information filter up and make sure that they get their needs met. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And that does look, that sounds, again, very like a systems view, thinking about how how we're giving, who, who's talking to who, and how yeah. we make that, that more effective. So thank you for that. Um, and, and the last question from me then is, what's the future look like? What's on the horizon? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what are you working on now? Uh, don't tell us all the details, but I suppose give us something that you think, you know, yeah, this is what I want to achieve next. You know, this is mm. where my, my persistence is going. For the last 14 years, maybe every three to five weeks, I would have received a call from a community inundated with poor quality, inappropriate, revolting donations. And they would ring me and they would say, can you please set up Give It here in a town I have never heard of suffering from post-hurricane in the US or Germany or homelessness in Seattle, like, you, you name it. I've just got people who can't, they can't get the, if they can't get the donations that they need and they're inundated with stuff that they don't need. And I would have always been waiting for someone to build the Give It model where a charity requests what they want, they can, we can either buy it and 100% of those funds get spent on that item and they, we deliver it actually straight to the recipient now and or you can give it and donate it and the charity will then pass it on to the donor. And we buy locally because we've got to make sure that those communities that have been impacted, we've got to resurrect their economy as yeah. well. They've, that's, they've taken a battering as well. So I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for Jeff Bezos, someone, come on. <laughs> and no one has done it. And wow. um, I, so I've started a new business and I, 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 I was, really, I've really deeply thought about this because this is not a minor project. So the business is called Recovery, but it's not a Y at the end, it's an E. Recovery, and it's going, and I've built a platform, We're build, I'm building a platform designed to support international communities who need, who are unprepared and prepared or, you know, for, uh, with their donation management post-crisis. Wow. And I think that I am probably best placed to do that because, mm. you know, I've done seven and a half million donations. I've kind of seen it all. And I think that um, I've been working with an amazing woman called Emma for the last year, hello, who's helped me design all the wireframes. And so this year I'm moving into a development phase. Global. A global donation management platform. And of course, you know, I know that this sounds <laughs> really crazy, but if just one donation happens, that's enough. I'll do it anyway. Just one, and then I'll do it. So I'm just doing it for one. I'm just doing it for one. But honestly, it honestly, like, yeah. it might epically fail, but I actually, I'm just going to do it anyway. Because you've heard some stories, and I'm, yeah, I'm mm. going to eat into question time here, because I'm getting excited now about, you know, how even globally uh, inappropriate donations get sent around the world to disasters oh, yeah. and earthquakes. And oh, I told her a story about this. Um, after the Nepalese earthquake, so someone in the UK donated nine tonne of high heel shoes and left it on the end of the runway in Nepal and blocked all aid. Now, I've got to verify all of these, but I've been told this, and so inappropriate, poor quality donations are happening all the time. So why don't we actually flip the model and ask communities, the small community groups, not the big ones that come and go, but the small community groups that aren't going anywhere, why don't we ask them what they need, what their community needs, 
and maybe someone on the planet will give to that need. I'm just hoping. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, I like the fact that that's a great segue into the first question, which is what's the most unusual item that you've seen either donated or requested through Give It? What's a, an unusual one that you can share? <sighs> yes. Oh, I've got a... I've got a million, I'm sorry, Anonymous, I have a million of those. Um, I mean, I, I, so just quickly, just off the top of my head, the nail clippers. I couldn't believe that nail clippers, big nail clippers were requested. I couldn't believe a charity couldn't afford the nail clippers for the client. But it was the first time, it was really precious and special. They wanted them in a packet from the, from the and they wanted them brand new, or visibly brand new, because it's the first time that that man had ever been able to hold a blade because he had been so suicidal. Wow. Um, I, um, yeah. I think also, the, and I know that we're eating, I'm just going to talk about just, I know it's International Women's Week and it's all about inclusive, but I just want to tell you that there are some, there's one donation that's removed all my bias, all my, I, I realise that I really have had a lot of unconscious bias and um, it's, what's it called, gender? I'm just, I'm so... Gender inequity. I, gender, I'm just, there was a woman who requested a boxing bag for oh. herself and she was desperate in need of a boxing bag. But anyway, I saw it on the list and I said to Megzi, who was our volunteer in Western Australia, I think that that's an I, I need, not an I want. You have to get it off the list. And Megzi goes, no, it's a really good charity. We need this boxing bag. So um, I said, OK, leave it on the list. I've got so much authority. <laughs> leave it on the list. And so um, the boxing bag got donated. The charity got told that I had concerns about it. And the charity wrote me a letter saying, thank you so much for permitting the boxing bag. The mother has received it and installed it. Since she's installed it, the kids have been using it and they have not hit her once. So we really have to um, trust the not-for-profits yeah. and we have to trust the charities. So thank you, Anonymous. I, oh, you've gone. I thank you so much for that, but um, the boxing bag was a story that really changed my brain. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Another question for you. Many of us suffer from imposter syndrome in leadership roles. Mm. What advice would you give to young women who don't feel, sometimes older women too, who don't feel they belong in a leadership role? Uh, I think... Um, I, I never really felt like an imposter. I just felt like people thought I was. So that's pretty sad. Um, so I felt like they just didn't, as I said to before, I don't think that they felt like I fit the role. Um, but to you, Anonymous, I feel like um, I would really not worry about what people think, but how hard is that when they tell you what they think? So um, <laughs> how about we start a movement of not listening to what people say <laughs> and or, you know, um, and if they have negative feedback, get them to write it in a book and tell them you read it later. Yeah. Mm. But leadership is, <laughs> leadership is not always a, you know, something on a name badge, is it? I mean, young women in particular who, I, who are innovators like yourself, who see a need, who desperately want to uh, resolve something or address or help mm. in some way, um, just sharing that or getting out there and inspiring other mm. people. Building to do a community so. of support. Build, yeah, that's leadership, isn't yeah. it? So we've, we've so got to stop, stop stereotyping leadership, really, isn't it? Oh, I mm. definitely recommend mentoring sessions or just have a coffee with someone who and ask five questions every yeah. couple of weeks. In, it's very informative. They'll ask you about you and they'll support you. But building a community of a support of people who know what you're doing and then getting to that point where you want to have a board or an advisory board if you want to keep it, you know, non governance -y. <laughs> OK. Did you feel intimidated by the digital side of Give It? Because it does sound like you weren't very techie before. Not very techie um, at all. Did it ever seem too hard to build what you had in mind, your vision? So when I would explain it to people, I was just creating a digital data place for donations. All the IT people just got it. 
but it took me a long time to come up with that. You know, so no, I um, thank you, but I had to really work hard at uh, what was that left side of the brain? I don't know. I had to I had to work on that pretty hard to get my my mind around that. Like current for the last year, I've been working with Emma, and she's been my functional left brain. And, and that's what it sounds like that you've collaborated yeah. with people who yes. understood how to make your vision come into you know being and the reality. Yes. Um, so again, it sounds like yeah, you don't always have to know everything, do you? No, I, you just have to surround yourself with brilliant people. Yeah. And it's really lucky that I was saying before is that the give it model, the, the model, is attractive to really smart, intelligent women. I think that's my absolute good luck charm there. Yeah. Because otherwise, it would never have got off the ground. Yeah. So a really smart women want to help me. Yeah. Mm. So I just want to touch on, again, the Women's Day uh, theme of looking mm. at how we encourage more women to use uh, innovation and uh, technology. You know, what's your take on that? Like, what's your thought about that? Should we encourage more women to use technology to be innovative? Yeah, I think um, we, we, I need, I'm starting from the basics where our most impoverished don't have access to technology. So we run yes. a digital inclusion campaign where if you've just got uh, you know, a mobile phone or a smartphone or a device, that is an absolute game changer, particularly laptops, as you know, yes. for people. So we need tens of thousands of more technological devices yes. to fill the need. But what we found is in the studies, and I'm sure your teams have worked on it, but if you don't have a device, you pay 30% more for everything because you just don't have that research tool. So uh, being deviceless makes you more yeah. impoverished. Yes. So it's the cycle. We've really got to pull them out of that. So yes, I want to encourage everybody to be on technology, um, except I my kids who need to be on less technology, <laughs> <laughs> as we all know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I looked on Give It earlier today and um, noticed that there was one lady that needed a laptop, and um, but you had separated out laptop from mouse. And I was interested in that because I thought, wow, well, even if I could just give the mouse, mm. and I'm sure I've got a mouse around my house that I could donate, maybe someone else could give the laptop and then you'd actually separated out the laptop bag. And I thought, well, that's cool actually because I can then choose to give it all or I can choose to collaborate with other Givers, yeah, and and then create that that gift to that that woman um, because it said um, this lady needs that laptop. Yeah, um, and I thought again, wow, you know, again, I'm so privileged. It made me think that I can, if I need a laptop, I can go get one. Um, but there is someone here that could uh, really, really need that, and and I just again felt compelled and thought, how can I make that happen? It inspired mm. me, yeah, to go out and see how I could help. We also found through the pandemic that the elder generation didn't have smartphones so they weren't connecting to their loved ones because they were yeah. so isolated so really when it comes to you know my empathy going uh, but this like we had grandparents and elderly people who were seriously lonely and they were important to have smart devices well, they're coming okay. in strong oh, we've got a couple a couple more questions i think we can uh, ask you um there's one here that says, how did you take that small idea, and you're obviously just working from home, uh, how did you take that small I idea to really scaling and employing others? Did you, where did you get your finance from? Where did you yeah, get your grants? Yeah, no, <laughs> my husband... What's your business model? <laughs> yes. um, my husband was generous and um, gave us a room in his office at Newstead, and his business donated enough for us to just have an accountant and keep the lights on really, but he paid for the electricity as well. So, you know, the, photo, the photocopier and things like that. And so would not have got off the ground without his support. And then um, he also paid for an accountant. So uh, I've got a lot of friends in the room. I just, they, they would vouch for this is the way I did accounting. Once a month, I'd put all the bills out and I'd put them in order and then I would put them through the system and it was flawed. Anyway, so the first thing that we got critically was an accounts officer to come in part time. And that streamlined things really quickly. That was the first. And then the Queensland government came forward and gave us funds to manage offers of goods and services in times of disasters annually. And that was 2012, 13. And since then, Give It's now sustainable via its contracts. 
but we don't do disaster recovery in states that we are not funded because we just don't have the staff. Yeah. But the, the model of helping charities for free across the nation happens all the time, but that disaster recovery is, is more challenging, difficult work and that we need funding for. Yeah, so again, that sustainability of yeah. your business model is really important. And, and again, I think that is really important for us to understand is that charities need to keep the lights on all charities mm. need that money to do the uh, the, the things that people don't see. Yeah. Um, but it is the accounts, it is the infrastructure, it is mm. the operations that we need to keep charities going, and and that's really critical for our ongoing sustainability. Okay. Um, did you have a mentor? Going back to mentors. Who or who have been your mentors? Oh, uh, have you had, yeah, who have been? Um, I haven't had a lot of female mentors, actually, except my girlfriends. Um, so I would generally have a problem and I would generally have a night out with a girlfriend and we would just nut it out until we solved it. <laughs> and, um, and then they would do that too. Um, but in a formal session, um, I've got, um, whenever I've got a big hairy problem, I would probably go and see someone who is in that craft. So if I have an accounting issue, I would go and see, um, you know, one of our board members, James Whitelaw. If I had an, this type of issue, I would see someone else. Yeah. And if they're really clever, they, I just move them onto the board. <laughs> really clever. Good Come technique. with me. Come here. Um, we might have one more question, but I, I'm, I, and these are all fantastic questions, but I think I'm going to, steal the last one mm. and just say, Julia, thank you for inspiring us today. Like, haven't we enjoyed this story and, you know, what you've shared with us? Um, I'm terribly inspired and all of you can go away and have a look at the Give It platform and, and be inspired yourself. But I really want to just ask the last question, which is, you know, what should, or not should, what could people do uh, tomorrow morning when they wake up and they're thinking about this story that you've shared and, and they're thinking about what you've done? You know, what would you encourage people to go out and the first thing for them to do, to, to you know, go and meet, think about their dreams or...? I would um, urge everybody to feel very grateful because a full heart has lots of love to give. So feel grateful for your pillow and if you've got someone to cuddle, and if you've got cutlery, and if you've got a functioning dishwasher, and if you have a washing machine, just be super grateful for what you have. Um, I feel super grateful, and I feel like that's my, it's not an antidepressant of sorts, but it kind of just resets me, and then I feel full. I think because the heart, and I've always told the Give It team this, because they sometimes in a disaster, they won't put the laptop away, and they won't stop working, and I say, but the heart needs to pump in to pump out, and if you just pump out all the time, you will suffer. So, and I feel like everyone here is very empathic and caring. And I think that I, I, I presume that um, that you all are givers, and um, because you're here talk, talking to a philanthropist, I suppose, or a person who loves to give, and um, we probably need to make sure that we, you know, continuously taking care of ourselves and be really grateful and then go to the Give It website <laughs> and have a look and see if there's any linen that you no longer require or there's any cutlery that you no longer require or go and take a photograph of everything with dust on it, take, take the dust off, and <laughs> in the, in the, underneath the stairs or in the garage and just put it into the virtual warehouse because honestly, simple things make a massive difference to yeah. people's lives. Little nail clippers make a massive difference to people's lives. And to know that it's come from someone that they've never met makes their heart full. So I definitely... Yeah, um, I love that. I yeah. love that. And we really underestimate how much junk we have in our house. Mm. And um, good junk, like really yeah. good quality stuff, <laughs> um, because we don't want to burden you with, with um, stuff that isn't good enough. Yeah, but nothing broken or with missing parts. Yeah, yeah. So the really good stuff that you have <laughs> that is collecting dust, I think we underestimate how much we have there. So thank you so much. And thank you. It's been really enjoyable. Thank you. Can we thank Juliet? <laughs> Um, 
pleasure, uh, absolute pleasure talking to you today. Um, thank you very much for sharing your story. Thank you everybody for coming along tonight, both uh, in the room and online. It's been so lovely to spend International Women's Day with you. Um, I would like to now invite Amanda Goodmanson from QUT to come and close the evening event and say thank you as well. Lovely. Thanks so much, Ruth. Thank you, um, Juliet and Ruth, for a really very inspiring um, conversation tonight. What a great way to start off Game Changers with a game-changing philanthropist with <laughs> Give It. Stories from bathing children and fighting against the universe telling you no to speaking with the royal family and, <laughs> and sharing, you know, their philanthropy with, with communities that need. How incredible is that? <laughs> you must be really welcome around, you know, dinner party tables. So wear those clothes and those lovely shoes and share that story because you've really inspired all of us here this evening. So thank you very much you. for coming along. Friends and colleagues and, and folks online, just a, a reminder as well that um, if you'd like to revisit this conversation and indeed share this conversation, because I'm sure it would inspire others, um, it will be available with a transcript um, on the website, on the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame website within a, probably about the next week. So please, once again, let's thank our conversationalists tonight Juliet Wright from Give It and Ruth Knight from QUT. So we look forward to bringing you more inspiring stories of the creative and the inventive entrepreneurs in our community as we uh, move through the year. So please keep contact with our website and look for the, the future events that are coming, probably something more towards the middle of the year and later on in the year. I'd like to close by thanking our partners, the State Library of Queensland and the Queensland Library Foundation and the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame community, including our partners, Picture Partners, Channel 7, our major sponsors, Morgans, Ray White and the Springfield City Group for their ongoing support and commitment, which helps us to bring you these inspiring stories. So thank you very much for your attendance here this evening and online, and please, safe travels home, everybody.